Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I am very proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence in Biomedicine, where every Friday we enjoy presentations from leading thinkers about the promise opportunities and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held here in June in Charlottesville, Virginia. Today, I am delighted to welcome not one but two speakers, Dr. Sally Ann Keller and Dr. Stephanie Shipp from the UVA Biocomplexity Institute here at the University of Virginia. Sally Ann Keller is a distinguished professor in biocomplexity, the director of the Social and Decision Analytics Di Division of the Biocomplexity Institute and professor of public health sciences. Her areas of expertise are social and decision informatics, statistical underpinnings of data science, and data access and confidentiality. She is a leading voice in creating the science of all data and advancing this research across disciplines to benefit society. Stephanie Shipp is Deputy Director and Professor of the Social and Decision Analytics Division. Um, her areas of expertise are economic policy analysis and evaluation. Her work spans topics related to the science of data science, community analytics, and ethics. She is a leading and engaging um, uh, person in projects at the local, state, and federal levels to assess data quality and uh, use of new and traditional data sources to advance the public good. In continuing our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science in, um, Seminar Series theme, Sally and Stephanie's lecture today is entitled Data Acumen in Action. Sally and Stephanie will drive home the idea that data science is the quintessential translational research field that starts at the point of translation, the real problem to be solved. It involves many stakeholders across fields of practice and lends itself to team science. Consequently, data science has evolved into a powerful transdisciplinary endeavor and doing public oriented data science has revealed that many of the consumers in this research do not have sufficient data acumen and thus can be overwhelmed with how to use data-driven insights. They, uh, Sally and uh, Stephanie will rightly note that it's unrealistic to think that most decision makers are data scientists. And so we have a lot of work to do in training them because even with domain knowledge, some literacy in data science remains useful. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you are watching on YouTube today, thank you so much for joining us. Our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Sally and Stephanie via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of their lecture. And with that, Sally and Stephanie, welcome. We are so excited to hear from you today. Thank you, Jack. Um, this is Sally. I'm going to start um, and I'll be handing off uh, to Stephanie about midway through the presentation. I thought I would start today by just sharing with you a little bit about the Biocomplexity Institute at University of Virginia. It's a very unique organization. It's a freestanding research institute within the university. Um, it's reporting lines like uh, the deans of schools is directly to the provost. And the span of research in this institute is really exciting. It, it ranges from mathematical biocomplexity, theoretical mathematics around omics, genomics, sequencing, what we might have called bioinformatics um, of years gone by, but that really theoretical mathematical uh, level of things. And then it starts to move through from sort of the molecular level into other behavioral scales, into massive simulations around people and um, movements of people in places. And that's our network system science and advanced computing division. So some of the COVID model, COVID modeling that you've seen coming out of University of Virginia that's helped to support the state of Virginia, uh, New York City and other places have come out of this particular group among other things. And then as you sort of drive towards evidence-based policy, you start to, uh, 
engaged with the research of our division, the Social Decision Analytics Division. And because of this really strong policy focus of our work, we're actually situated up here in Northern Virginia to make sure that we wake up every morning remembering that we're in the policy capital of the world and that we're keeping our eyes and our, um, our eyes wide open on how we can bring our work to bear on important public policy. So that's us. And so now we're going to start. And I always like to start by just reminding ourselves what is data science, because this is all about data science and, and uh, you know, ethical issues related to data science. Well, what the heck is data science anyway? Um, and as, you know, Jack said, we view data science as a science that starts at the point of translation because it is in the context of real problems. I like to remind people that if we don't have a problem, there's no real data science. You know, AI, machine learning, uh, statistical methods, all of these things are tools that we use in data science. They, not, they are not in and of themselves data science, at least in my opinion. Um, and what's really important too is to remember that if you're going to focus on problems, problem solutions require carefully framed questions. And that will play a role as we talk about data acumen. We have had a lot of data science partners in our work. We're in our ninth year as a research organization, and we have done research with sponsors from industry, from local, state, and federal agencies, from local governments, and also from DOD, most specifically the Army recently. Another thing that's really important to remember is that data science is a team sport, and there you see part of our team, um, and it's really about engaging together across disciplines, across uh, areas of expertise to come together and bring the best that you can to a particular problem. Okay, so let's talk about what we're calling data acumen, which may be a new term for you. And data acumen, the definition that we like to use is the ability to make good judgments about the use of data to support problem solutions. Let's unpack that. When we talk about use of data, the first question that should come to mind is what the heck are data? And we're going to talk about that. It's not necessarily an obvious answer. And then this issue of supporting problem solutions, what comes to mind there is how do you trust the use and the results for data informed decisions? Now, there are levels of data acumen. Uh, many of you in the audience are data scientists. You're trained in statistics or computer science, quantitative methods, applied math. Some of you are probably subject matter experts that you're trained in a particular field. Um, some of you may, may cross over between those two things. And some of you, or at least a lot of the people that we work directly with are consumers of data science and of these data science applications. They're neither a data scientist, you know, or a particular subject matter expert, but the information is coming to them and they have to consume it. So, you know, the question is, which are you? I'll let you think about that. But when we think of helping people become consumers, when we think of helping the communication between data scientists and subject matter experts, that's where trying to think about how do you actually frame and characterize data acumen so we can all grow more of it. So when we think about data acumen and when we think about the people that we work with on our research teams, with our sponsors, we have a set of questions that we like to keep in the front of our mind to make sure we're walking through as we're working with them. And the first one is, you know, what is the problem or the question that they're trying to, uh, that they're trying to address? Again, data science is about bringing data together to help support a problem and a problem solution. What kinds of decisions are they trying to make? You know, what data might be out there? How do you trust it? How do you help them trust it if they're a consumer? What kinds of analysis? Would, might be needed to support their decisions? You know, what are the ethical considerations? And then finally, there is a data science process and trying to understand that process and where you are in that process is important. We're gonna walk through those questions um, in the context of a couple examples. The first one is a, one of the very first problems that we worked or the very first partnerships that we 
created when we started our research group about nine years ago. And this is within Arlington, Virginia. Arlington, Virginia is in Northern Virginia. It has about 240,000 in population. It covers 26 square miles. It has a pretty low unemployment rate and a white population of 61%. So we started working with the Arlington County government and they had a particular problem in question that they brought to us. The problem was they'd been hearing about the data revolution and data science and they wanted to know how can they develop data informed situational assessment or situational awareness that could help improve quality of life and services in the, in the county. And the very specific qu first question came from the fire chief who really started to understand about this data stuff. And what he wanted to know is, would it be possible to link together the fire EMS data that gets generated to administer fire EMS 911 incidents? Would it be possible to pull that data across their data systems, link it together end to end and recreate the incidents in the data? Because he felt that if you could do that, that data could be used to build an understanding, to build some analyses to help them understand resource allocation, resource utilization and training. So um, we said, sure, why not? Let's see what we can do. So the next question that comes to mind was what kinds of decisions was he interested in? Was he interested in strate strategic decisions, trying to put this information together to help inform things more strategically, future planning, future placement of fire boxes and fire stations? Was he interested in anticipatory decisions, trying to understand what are changes that, are, that might occur over the county over the coming you know, weeks, months, years that might change the direction that they go with different things? Or were they looking for tactical decision-making like a real-time uh, board that would tell you what's going on in a 911 situation? Well, it turns out that it was the anticipatory and strategic area that the fire chief was interested in. They didn't really want or need help in managing, you know, on the fly these incidents. What they wanted to do was to collect them and reevaluate what had happened through a corpus of data by mashing up the 911 incident data with socio socioeconomic data. So what data are they really talking about and what are going to be trust issues with these data? So that brings me to ask the question, what are data? And I like to think of data as a fact assumed to be a matter of direct observation. In other words, you need to observe something. Questions are needed to inform direct observation. So we're kind of back to this importance of these questions that inform our problems. And then once you have a sense of what that direct observation is, you need measurement. You need to convert that observation into facts, and those facts are the data. Well, let's see what we have. Well, today we can observe a tremendous amount of information, you know, infrastructure, environment, people, and many more boxes should be on this chart. Um, historically, we tended to treat these things, you know, kind of in siloed pieces of information. We built infrastructure models, environmental models, people models. But today, the exciting thing is we can blend this all together and really mash it up. The measurement we're talking about is we're really talking about identifying archival data, existing data, you know, not necessarily primary collected data, but secondary sources. And measurement is about data repurposing, just data repurposing on steroids. But it's important to think about how the data are born that you're repurposing it. Did it come from a design data collection? Is it administrative data? that's just out there to administer an organization. And that's gonna be the lion's share of our data for this particular problem. Is it data that just is out there, you know, on opportunity data on the internet and 
um, other places that you could scrape and pull in. And then a fourth bucket of data that's incredibly important is procedural data, which could be the procedure that runs the stoplight on the, on, on the street or the different laws and procedures and policies that govern an organization. It's important to know how that interfaces in with what you're doing. Okay, so here's our data. And I want you to look at the middle flow here to begin with the flows of events, an incident occurs, 911, boom, it comes in, it goes to a call center, the communication center, a unit is dispatched, a unit arrives at the location. They do whatever they need to do, the incident is closed, and then there's some post-incident reporting. So that's what's happening. Well, there's data systems that exist that administer every one of those steps. What doesn't exist is a magic little ID number that takes you from one data system to the next, to the next, to the next. That's not how they were built. And that's not what their function, that's not what their function is designed for. Then there's also other data like American Community Survey data or social media, other data that if I have locations, whether it's the housing locations or the dispatch route, I can now start to think about how to attach these data together. So that's what we were confronted with, and we wanted to try to recreate these incidents. So what we did, we took all those data sources and we just started to line them up in time and on date to see if we could identify and now start to trace units through their actions and trace the reporting through, you know, connected up with an incident. And we actually were successfully able to do this. Here's a picture of where you're seeing these data linked, which had great relevancy to police chiefs because they also started to see their unit utilization. I can't say that it rocks my boat, but I did, you know, we did this to get the data repository, to get the data set that we needed to have all these corpus of incidents end to end. But it turns out a simple visualization like this spoke volumes to the fire chiefs. So the next thing to think about when you're thinking about data acumen is what types of analyses can you do or are needed to inform the decisions that you want to try to make. So now we have this corpus of data that we've linked together. It was no trivial task to do that, but now we have something we can work with. Well, types of analyses, they come in flavors. We have descriptive analyses, prescriptive analytics, which really summarizes um, and represents the data that you have a great way to check. Did you link it properly? Data then from descriptive can be used for explanatory studies. This might help you test causal hypotheses, constructs, theories, or you might be wanting to use it for predictive analytics that really helps you try to predict something in the future. And then the other thing that you like to do if you can is to create simulations possibly from the data to help ask what if questions, counterfactual analysis of the data and information. And in our institute, we spend a lot of time building platforms that help you query and study this. And then prescriptive analytics is sort of the holy grail that people would like to get to, where you're really trying to do stochastic optimization over constraints that are placed on predictive models. Well, in our example, the early thing that we did was to take this beautiful data that we'd linked together and just try to draw some early data insights that we could feed back to the fire chief and his folks. And the very first thing was to just look at how much time were they spending on call because minutes matter in this situation. So in this particular case, they could see how their different units were functioning and how much time they were spending on call. It's a log scale on minutes, by the way, on the uh, vertical axis. Then the next thing that they were really interested in was what about the response time? Because again, minutes matter. And particularly response time from the different fire stations. Were all of the fire stations behaving similarly or were there certain ones where there could perhaps uh, improve their response time? And so this was another descriptive um, picture that you see here. And you know, you look at this and you don't really see much going on because the data are noisy. And so, you know, we looked at this and thought, well, okay, this is still descriptive. Can I take this data and now do something explanatory with it? 
And that was the next step. And in the explanatory analysis, it was to disentangle the fact that we had different kinds of incidents. Some were fires, some were EMS, some were critical things that were going to end up at the hospital, some were, you know, somebody stubbed their toe. So there was a whole different set in types of incidents going on. And different incidents lead to different apparatus, different kinds of vehicles, different kinds of equipment that get sent. So putting that together and developing a statistical model that can control for all of these things presented a pretty different picture back to the fire chief. Now you see there's very significant differences in response time by the different stations and across the area across the county, which then gave them an opportunity to delve further into trying to understand why that is and what they could do about it. Well, what about ethical considerations? And I'm going to flip to a slightly different example um, with the fire department for that. But ethical considerations, first, let me just remind you what they are. And this whole series this year that um, Jack and company are having is around ethics and ethics in AI or ethics in data science. And this is just one of my most favorite examples about why we have to worry about ethics. And you probably, many of you probably already know this example back in 2016, when Amazon went to their one day service and they decided what parts of different cities were they gonna roll this service out to, they looked at their data, which had to do with sales and sales volume in different areas. And they decided which neighborhoods they would roll this out to. And unbeknownst to them, their data analysis completely defined the racial boundaries in these cities. Um, so that was sort of an aha moment. We have to really worry about what are different models, and these were AI models in this case, what are they doing? You know, are they really capturing what you want to capture? Or are they capturing other features that are somewhat unintended? So really thinking through your data and what possible biases could exist there. Well, we have things to guide us. We have the um, fabulous Belmont report that I'm assuming most of you are familiar with, which lays out the foundation for institutional review boards and the common rule that governs research in the United States when it comes to having respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And when you think of the Belmont Report, it's laying the framework on what you need to be worried about, thinking about. We go, you know, the training, if you've never taken institutional review board training, I encourage you to do it because it takes you through a lot of thought processes around ethics particularly when you're focusing on human subjects. Well, not all of our data are about human subjects and not all of our focus is necessarily human subjects. And it turns out that there's a wonderful report that came out in 2012. It was commissioned by the Department of Homeland Security that uh, we find interesting that's pretty underutilized and under-recognized and it's called the Menlo Report. And in this report, what they were tasked to do was to take the Belmont principles and look at how they apply in an information communication technology setting. And they extended the principles to include respect for law and public interest. And this has a focus on research with human harming potential. So I encourage you to look at this report. It's, it was great uh, committee uh, largely of pretty well-known computer scientists that worked on this, but it takes Belmont and maps it into this other space. So between these two reports, you can start to create the picture of data science ethics because data science involves both of those aspects. And if you add to that, you know, some of what you know and have learned from ethical guidelines from professional societies, read what experts have written around ethical questions. You can start to think about what are the questions and the ethical issues you need to be worried about during the whole life cycle of a data science project. And we've done that. And the link here takes you to a data science ethics checklist that we've created that is a living document 
for us during the course of our projects where we're continually revisiting these issues. And at each stage of the data science process, we're asking questions and we're asking questions around ethics, around, you know, what are these data actually representing? Who's being missed? What are the biases? As I'm developing my methods and algorithms, you know, where are the biases in those uh, different methods as well? Well, back to our um, fire department. This is a slightly different um, example because I think it highlights the ethical issues uh, quite well. In this particular case, the fire chief, uh, another question that he came to us with, he said, you know, we go out once a year, there's a week where we go door to door and we ask people to invite us into their homes so that we can check their smoke detectors. First of all, do they have an adequate number? And the ones that they have, are they working? If not, the fire uh, fighters will actually change them out for you. Well, they typically would just sort of go wherever with no particular strategy of which neighborhood to go to. They would go when they had some time during that week, whatever they were sort of closest to. And so the question was, is there a better way to do that? And so you can already begin to see some of the ethical issues of just doing it where you are. Um, and so they gave us the data that they had for a few years of where they went in the county and what they found. And we were able to take that and put a machine learning model together and actually map out, and, and we were able to mash that up with other things like how old the housing units were, other different socioeconomic um, indicators across the county, you know, again, at these different locations on a census block group basis. And we were actually able to build a model, a predictive model that told them where they would have the highest percentage of homes that perhaps were in need of their help. Now, that in and of itself is also a bit of an ethical issue because is it fair to just go to the red areas here or should they really be spreading out across the entire county? So we were able to provide them this information and then encourage them to do a mix of where they were going. And then in the next year, they you know, gave us, they went out and uh, also provided the data back. We were really pleased that our model actually did quite well. And we were able to provide them an even um, you know, better updated set of information of what the status looked like across the county. So with that, this brings us to the last question in our data acumen set of questions. And I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie at this point. Thank you, Sally. Um, that sets the stage nicely for uh, moving on to our data science framework. I'm going to introduce our data science framework, our community engagement process, and then a case study that demonstrates the power of data acumen from the beginning to the end of the project, much as Sally does did, but in a, a slightly different approach. Um, so to address our data science problems for the public good, we've developed this data science framework to guide our processes. And it provides for us a comprehensive and rigorous way for doing data science. Um, I like to think about it as having three main components. So you have communications and dissemination on the left, you have the analytics in the middle, and then you have your ethics. And recently we've been thinking about adding ethics and equity review on the right hand thing, on the right hand side. And all three are essential to achieving data acumen. Um, and they're also intertwined. And the reason for the two bars along the side is that we are doing that at every stage of the analytics uh, process. So the analytics um, component emphasizes working in collaboration with our consumers. Sally's talked about that a lot. Um, but the important thing here is that we're trying to develop a shared understanding of the context of, of what are the real questions that they want. And we're trying to do that in a way that is focused, unbiased research questions as the first step. And I, I like to say that this is often the hardest part of the project because defining um, seemingly clear and unbiased questions uh, is challenging, as you all know. Um, but it's achieved through our conversations with stakeholders, the consumers, the experts, and of course, a review of the literature as well. 
And then throughout the process, we are always uh, communicating both internally with the team as well as sharing our results externally, because of course that's where you get your feedback. And we also are also seeking feedback about the ethical dimensions along the way. So it's an iterative process. That's why there's the circle in the middle. Um, so it's not a linear process at all, but each step informs the other, both prior and, and going forward. And what I love about our data science framework is that it really helps you say, okay, we've defined these clear questions, now what's next? And, and um, going through our data discovery, our data ingestion and governance, the wrangling of the data, and then our statistical modeling and analysis and fitness for use. So next slide, Sally. And then along with our data science framework, we've, um, through working many problems with many communities, we've developed a community engagement process. And again, it, the community participates in asking and answering questions. I think that's really uh, part of the beauty of this process is building their capacity to do that, to know that they, they have the power uh, to ask and, and get answers to these questions and work with us to develop those answers as well. Um, and so looking at this wheel, um, the outer wheel is the continuous interaction and communications across stakeholders and communities. And then the middle wheel is more of the data learning process as we um, have defined. You, you're, you, you, know, you start by, you're working with the community to discover the data, to integrate the data, to act on those measure and then an evaluate and then a redirect. So that's why you know, the continuous cycle. And then the frontier between the two uh, represents the active collaboration between all partners. And then of course, in the middle um, is our rigorous data science framework that guides the data science work. Uh, next slide, Sally. So now I wanna present an end-to-end -end example of posing and answering the data acumen questions similar to what Sally did, um, as, you know, as well as integrating that with our community engaged that process and describing that process as it unfolds. Um, next slide. So the Ro this is gonna be about the Roanoke Valley Allegheny region. And it's a beautiful region. It has five counties and three cities in Western Virginia. And sort of the anchor is the city of Roanoke. It has a population of about 300,000, a little over 300,000 people, and an unemployment rate of 2.8%. And it is predominantly white, although it is um, that number keeps dropping, um, but not, not as low as what we saw in Arlington. Um, next slide. So we worked with the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Region Commission. I'm just going to refer to them as the commission throughout, and they are the consumer in this case. Um, and they are one of 21 planning commissions in Virginia. And so we asked them, you know, what is, what is the problem you wanna solve and what are your questions? Um, next slide. And what they were interested in was building a workforce. Um, they said to us, you know, we have dozens of universities around us within, you know, 25, 50 miles, yet only 5% of the graduates actually stay in our region. How do we attract them um, to stay you know, and, and become productive, you know, have their families here, um, have, you know, work, work in the labor force in, Ro in the Roanoke region. And so that led us, we thought actually when they initially asked us the question, we were going to do a very much labor market kind of analysis. Um, but when they started talking about what, what would it take to attract experienced workers um, from other regions, as well as to keep the recent graduates, we realized that that was the question that we wanted to ask. What are the factors that make an area attractive to workers and families? And what challenges does the region face? So the next slide, Sally. So what kind of decisions need to be made? Um, the next step was to see if we could frame this issue to develop uh, a strategic plan. They were interested in a developing a strategy that would help them make their region more attractive to attract workers, both singles and families. So we first looked at what other communities were doing. Um, we also explain, explored with the commission how to frame their question in a data context. Um, so next slide, Sally. Um, so we asked, what kinds of data do you have available and why should I trust the data? Um, and part of our process, of course, is always to understand the quality of the data, and that helps us understand and trust it as well. Uh, next slide. So what we did was we sat down with the commission and created a data map. And this is a great tool for developing sort of a conceptual understanding 
of the project and gets both, you know, the consumer and, and the researchers working together and really rolling up their sleeves to say, okay, what is it that we're trying to address? So we did in fact focus on the behavior in the labor force and we decided that there were some internal labor force challenges and external labor force challenges um, that we were looking at. So on the internal labor force side, we looked at things such as drug use and prisoner re-entry and childcare cost um, and others, um, things like internal issues such as access to training and the ability to earn certificates. And then we also wanted to look at factors that were external to the labor force. So things about, you know, are primarily focused on the community. So how nice is it to live in the region? Are there parks? Is it walkable? Are there cultural events? And what about public transportation and commuting? How hard is it to commute? Um, that we did know was one of the challenges in, in the area as well. So in the middle of this data map is, um, you know, the households and the labor force comes out of the households. And of course, there's the eight cities or five, five counties and three cities that, that make up the whole region. And they're primarily concerned with the workforce development and attracting industry, as well as uh, families to support jobs in that industry as well. Um, next slide, Sally. So we undertook a data discovery process um, and the data map definitely helped us uh, guide that data discovery because we saw the kinds of data we wanted. Now we needed to look and understand or, or it's a process that we under, undertake um, to see what's out there, what, what data are out there in the wild that might inform our, our, um, pro, our project or our problem. We don't just rely on the data that we are familiar with. We really like to do this exploratory stage because we uncover some really interesting sources of data that help or help inform the research and provide new insights into addressing the research questions. Um, so we, when we do that, um, next slide, um, we actually undertake some what we call just descriptive analysis to begin looking at what these data sources look like. And this is just a, a little bit, some of the data that we were examining. We use multiple sources of data, always the traditional American Community Survey, but also data from the US Department of Education, the Virginia Employment Commission, CDC, and just many, many other sources, as you can see. And what's useful about this step is not just the data discovery, but we also begin to learn about the issues facing the region. So we learned about there was food insecurity and obesity, there's low population growth, and there's changes in income and unemployment. So all of that can affect how attractive a region, region is. Um, next slide. And then we also wanted to use some place-based data as well. Um, so one of the things, because we knew transportation was a challenge, um, we map public transportation, car ownership, and proximity to training sites or other services such as drug treatment facilities. And we discovered that most of those facilities were primarily located in the Roanoke, the city of Roanoke, or just closely related to that. And so if you lived, you know, in one of the counties, it was further to get there. And transportation is definitely an issue, especially for a lot of the workers. And so that was one of the problems that we identified. And just being able to map that data, um, you know, looking at the public transportation as well as the car ownership, you can see that, you know, getting to these sites is uh, uh, probably you have to have a car, a work, car that's going to work and get you there. Um, so anyway, that, that obviously lays the um, basis for some policy actions there as well. Um, next slide. Uh, so the next question uh, we asked is what's the type of the analysis that we're going to be doing? And uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to explore with the commission what might be useful metrics and how might we integrate uh, the, these data. And recall they had talked about attractiveness um, and how they were interested in using data to tell how attractive their region is, both to singles and both to families. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and so in this slide, what we did was we created these composite indicators using uh, some synthetic data that we had created from the American Community Survey and local property data. 
And then we mapped it by magisterial districts. And those are voting districts essentially, but we're, we live in the Commonwealth of Virginia, so they call them magisterial districts. But we did that at a sub-county subsidy level to approximate neighborhoods so that we're getting down and we can actually study different parts of the county or different parts of the city. And what we can see actually, when we look at these composites, which were composed of data for about transportation, housing, and then the community, is that the day, you know, singles are very different than families. Um, singles are more interested in living in urban environments. So that means they're more likely to live around the city of Roanoke, while families are more likely to live or be spread more out throughout the, um, throughout the region. And that might be, you know, they want larger homes or more yard or, or the schools, depending on, you know, the quality of the schools in the different areas as well. So this provided a tremendous amount of insight um, into in, for, for the commission to begin to able begin to think about what kind of policies that they wanted to think about. So I did, I think I forgot to add that the lighter the color, the more attractive is the area. So that's obviously for the singles, the lighter the color here and the lighter the color for families, you can see where they were interested in living in. So we worked with the uh, next slide. Um, we worked with the commission because we were also concerned about the ethical issues about our research. And we had conversations with the commission, with uh, um, the county and city planners, the service providers, and just people in different parts of the region. And there was a lot of sensitivity about uh, drug rehabilitation and pre prisoner reentry into the community and workforce. And they were just concerned that that might define their region as not being attractive. But the commission decided that these issues were too important to ignore and that policies are needed to support the populations. So it still provided motivation that they needed to address the issues broadly, um, but also focus in on training and some of the other issues as well, because these, um, a lot of this leads to, of course, a potential workforce um, that would, would populate that. Um, so what they did was, uh, I guess we just went through this slide, but this go, goes back, of course, to get back to each of um, our data science checklists, where at each stage, you know, again, to reiterate, we assess our research questions, our data sources, our models for implicit biases. We had lots of conversations with stakeholders. Uh, I talked about the sensitivity about certain groups and decided that these were too important to ignore. Next slide. So we were um, pleased to see that in the following year when they developed their strategies that they had addressed many of the issues that uh, we had pointed out through our composite indicators as well as looking at the individual composites as well that, that made up. And you can see they really, they actually align quite nicely with how we created um, the data and the indicators. Um, they did say that when they had worked with other groups before, like one group had given them a list of 100 indicators that they could use to track um, like progress in their region. And they just said it was overwhelming. And so they found the use of these composites really helpful and then creating, you know, these maps that a, a sub a lower geography than just counties and cities that they could actually understand the different areas uh, was enormously helpful to them. Uh, so let's uh, last slide, Sally. So to wrap up, um, this summarizes a lot of what you heard today. Um, data science, as we know, is foundational to our economy and lives. And we are passionate about requiring or not requiring, but teaching people or building capacity, especially communities, um, especially with about their level of data acumen. And that allows them to make good judgments about the use of data to support their problem solutions. That is our definition, as Sally noted. Um, but understanding the basics of data science and data acumen not only um, allows us to work with communities, but allows them to build their capacity to ask questions, use data, and to make data-informed data -informed decisions. So at the heart of our work is our data science framework and our CLD3, our community learning through data-driven discovery process. And that integrates our communications and ethics you know, across the analytical analytical parts of the projects. And these processes, they help us to accelerate, accelerate our work. And then importantly for us, it also helps us just identify our next steps. So, you know, as we go through the process, it's a guide to help us and a reminder to incorporate ethics 
and communications and dissemination into our work. So both are a scaffold also that allows us to document our work in a transparent way. So um, we think that it's really important and you can tell that we're passionate about incorporating ethics into our research and uh, we hope you found this useful. <laughs> thank you. Sally and Stephanie, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful overview. I really enjoyed hearing about your data science framework. That looks like a very useful tool for kind of solving, you know, identifying a problem and identifying data and then going through a process of iterating on that to come up with solutions. Um, one of the things that uh, I noticed that um, Sally had shown is uh, the, the Belmont report. And for those of us in biomedical science, if you've ever had to do a, any IRB training, the Belmont report is something that we all know about. The thing I thought was a little bit ironic about Sally's slide is that the, cut, the, the picture that you showed of the Belmont report comes from the for, Forgotten Books collection, <laughs> which I thought was rather interesting because clearly the Belmont report has given rise to um, many other things. The Menlo report, I wasn't very aware of. Um, but I was also interested, maybe you could discuss a little bit about how the evolution of these kind of ethical principles that were embodied in the Belmont report and the common rule before that, and now the Menlo report, how this dovetails with data openness and open science, um, team science, and how those then interact with data ethics and the considerations thereof. So Steph, I'm gonna pump that one to you. Okay, Stephanie, <laughs> you can answer that one. <laughs> So let me rephrase the question or make sure that I understand it because I was thinking Sally was gonna take this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the um, thinking about sort of the Belmont report and then the continuum along with the, the um, Menlo report and how that integrates with sort of all the facets of, of data science, including team science. I mean, I think it, it definitely, and open science and all of that, I think that it definitely raises awareness um, and issues about, you know, what the challenges are in data science, especially when you are integrating data. And a lot of times uh, on the surface, it may seem that you're taking data sources that are um, just transparent or that you can use because they seem to be publicly available, but there is a lot of concern about, you know, you take your cell phone data and you combine it with your Twitter data. And then all of a sudden you, you marry it with the local property data. Like, you know, can you begin to identify people or does it bring, does it highlight certain groups in a way that you may not, that is not positive or in a way that doesn't contribute to the conversation. And so the Menlo report spends a lot of time talking about like, some of the challenges or things that can happen when you begin to integrate the data. Um, so I guess those are the challenges that you might have to address when you're looking at open source data or we're also just working as a, as a team on that. So I, I'm sure that Sally can probably answer that <laughs> more cohesive <laughs> way. <laughs> so I think that the, I, you, one of the things that we found um, interesting when we, when we started our research group and when we started, you know, working on these problems um, with computer scientists data, you know, it, it now called data scientists and with the communities, is that a lot of computer scientists and data scientists who, uh, you know, that are out there working different problems, they're, they're, they're not aware of an IRB. They don't go through that training like Jack, you and others in the biomedical field have done. Yeah. Um, that, that that's, that's just not part of what they've had to do. They haven't had to think of their data that way. We've really been encouraging more of that to take place. Um, and the other thing that is interesting to us is that as we've been working with communities, because we work with a lot of local governments and local communities, that's not in their vernacular either. That, that's just not part of what they worry about, even though they're knitting together all of this data about you know, people, places, the economy. And so I think it's really useful to have something like this ethics checklist that, we, that we've talked about, that we've developed. And with your partners, with your sponsors, part of the project team, that you, you all go through some of this together and have these discussions. And to the question um, that Caitlin asked about, why do we think the Menlo report hasn't really been taken up by data scientists? That's one of our big mysteries. We don't know because it was sort of developed by this team of computer scientists. Now, perhaps 
uh, we don't have all the ins and outs of why or how the Department of Homeland Security asked for it. But I will say, in, ad in addition to the report that uh, Nicole has linked you to in the chat, there's also a follow-up where they do some case studies, and we can find that and share that with you. It's, it's pretty fascinating, and we wish that more people would focus in on some of these things. That's great. I know. Thank I always you. think about one of these days, I just want to pick up the phone or send an email to all those computer scientists and say, what happened? You know, <laughs> why is this probably, still buried? <laughs> probably isn't the first time. It won't be the last time that some, you know, uh, commissioned report sort of didn't really catch fire. But um, it, but it's interesting. And again, I didn't wasn't very aware of it. Um, hopefully some of our data science colleagues will now be inspired to go and look at it and see how it maps onto some of the work that they're doing. Um, in particular, um, I noticed that after you guys have, you know, you scoped out what the problem is, and then you start asking about the availability of data so that you can kind of go through a mapping operation of how does that data map onto your problem? What are some of the things that you look for in order to be able to trust that that data is valid? It's showing you what it's, you know, it says it's a measure. Is it really measuring what it says it's measuring? How do you trust it? How do you know that it's sufficiently large enough to represent the catchment area of, you know, of the county that you're trying to map? What are some of those things that you guys consider? So, so Jack, first I'd say that, you know, we have a, a pretty, uh, structured process, the data discovery process that we've developed over the over the years. And it starts by, you know, kind of getting the team together and just encouraging people to open their mind and their imaginations and make a wish list. If they have if you could have any data under the sun to help support the problem that you're working on, what would you want? And to just start writing that down. Don't worry about if it exists or not, just write it down. And then once we do that, we develop a screening process where we're going to now st start to go see if we can find any of these sources, but we'll have screening questions so that we don't waste too much time trying to go after some data if it's not going to meet the time frame, some of the variables that might be relevant here. So we actually you know, put a screening tool together to help screen the different sources. Um, and, you know, in one of them, you know, one element of the screening tool would be, you know, in what time frame might I be able to develop the data sharing agreement for this data? Because if it's going to take three years and my problem I have to get done in a year, it's not going to be helpful. So, so we sort of, so we have this sort of formal process, but then as we get the data, as we start acquiring the data, um, you know, we really do worry about fitness for use and fitness for use is a function of how the data is going to feed into a model or an analysis as well as how complete the data are. And so we worry a lot and we have conversations around coverage and bias. Um, who's left out of this data? Do I even, can I even tell who might be left out of this data? And the acknowledgement of that is really important because it's, we may still use it, but at least we acknowledge and we have documented what the limitations are in the interpretation of whatever analyses come out of this. And also it's important to note that don't waste time wrangling data that you might not use. I might have a big data file or a big data set or a big survey. I'm not gonna clean it all up. I'm just gonna really focus on those elements and clean them to the point that I need for the analysis that I'm gonna support. And a great example is we work a lot with housing stock and housing data and also multiple listing service data. And in the multiple listing service data, they have hundreds of variables that they collect um, but they're very, it's very uneven, the quality of the data, because for, to a realtor, some data is more important than others. And we have a situation where they collect zoning codes for their, for their properties, um, but they don't tend to pay a lot of attention to getting those codes right. And a lot of what we care about is, is it residential or not? And it turns out if they simply got an R in the, in the zoning code and the rest of the numbers, who cares? R meant it was residential. So we could take this incredibly noisy data, rather than throw it out, we could get the dichotomous mapping that we wanted just by being smart, by understanding what the data quality issues were. And just to add on to that, I think the fitness for use sometimes can be a simple benchmarking or that can almost be as creative as the ethics questions as well on trying to figure out that 
often sometimes can be a qualitative analysis or it can be quantitative if you have something that you can compare to. But as with all of this, it's as much an art as a science. That, that's the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing I, I noticed, um, in, when, Sally, you were mentioning um, you're working with uh, uh, you know, county level um, first responder data and you, uh, you noted that um, there was no say continual ID that kind of followed somebody throughout the trajectory of the thing, but you had just all this data, but I was wondering at what point that stops. And in the sense of the first responders, their measure of success were, okay, the victim of the accident was successfully delivered to the, the hospital where they could get further treatment. And then that was, that was it. They, they checked the box and they're done but it starts another process at the level of the hospital where, okay, patient is now admitted and then they're going to go. Da, 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 da. And so you've got this sort of chain of data that you know, may start and stop with one entity then it migrates to the next one. And if only you had that continuous stream, you could actually measure the, the efficacy of how the first responders did. Did they treat the wound properly so that treatment could be affected and the person survived or did something terrible happen to them when the first responders didn't do it right and the person died? You know, is it that kind of thing? And I was just kind of commenting or wondering if you could comment on how these kind of chains of data might be uh, leveraged um, in something like your data science framework, for example. Right. That's such a great question. Now, for the first responders, their window into the world ends at the emergency room. Yeah. You know, that's they, very, they deliver the patient to the emergency room and then right. they're, they're done. And, you know, and, and then, you know, yet you're right. It would be so wonderful to be linking this through and learning so much more. And the first responders would love to do that too. But there's all, but there's all different issues that happen as soon as it hits the hospital, right? And, yeah. but the one thing that I would say, if we could, you know, if we could develop that project <laughs> that allows us to cross <laughs> that chasm, it would be exciting. And we don't have to worry about having all these little unique identifiers to link this data. We were able to demonstrate by having these administrative systems that were disjoint across this, just across the path of the event of the incident yeah. that we've linked together, that we can be smart. Data science can help us figure out how to link the right data together. So if we could just begin to be getting that, you know, emergency room data we would have, you know, we would have different ways we could, we could um, link it into the other data without having to have some big, you know, data system developed to do that. I guess that's my point, that standardization is not needed on all of these things. Data science helps us get past that. Yeah. But that would be one, you know, I mean, that would be the wonderful thing. But that's, again, where we hit, a, hit up against um, just the HIPAA medical side that we don't hit up against in the EMS data. Although I think when we were trying to do this, this was like 2014, 2015, and things have started to really change. It seems like even hospitals are becoming more open about sharing their data as long as it's kept confidential. So, um, but we, we haven't gone back to try that yet. <laughs> well, I certainly hope that they do because that, that is a wonderful opportunity for sort of the approach that you took where you're temporally trying to align these different data types to see if you can identify correspondence between them and then allow you to bridge that chasm. Otherwise you have this weird discontinuity that you have to then, you know, oh, I don't have a identifier. At any rate, it sounds like it would be a maybe tractable kind of thing to right. begin investigating. Or maybe in Charlottesville where the hospital's more willing to share the data than they are maybe in other, other areas as well. Maybe, maybe in yeah. Roanoke, they're not so interested. I don't know. A, so one well, of this the, is Arlington, but still, yeah. Arlington, Arlington. One of the things we, one of the things we were able to look at, which was pretty interesting was when the, when an incident, when a call comes in, they sort of make an assessment of what it is so that they can determine what to dispatch. Right. And we actually did have then data of what they thought it was and what it was, you know, when their window into it ended. And those things didn't line up quite as well as they had expected, which is really useful information to the fire chief. Right. They have to make quick decisions. And then when they arrive, it's often something different. I can imagine, you know, somebody's, oh, yeah, my, my arm hurts. Oh, OK, you did something to your arm. And then it turns out, oh, no, it's a heart attack. And right. you know, it's exactly. like, obviously, you would have taken them to maybe a different location if you had known that. Yeah. All sorts of interesting data challenges. Well, 
Sally and Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing your, um, your process with us and uh, several really interesting examples that I think, you know, even though you, the, the areas you focused on were not necessarily biomedical per se, but all of those general ideas and how one evaluates data, how it goes through your data science framework process, um, those are all directly relevant to how people deal with data from biomedicine and especially um, keeping it ethical and thinking ethically about how that data gets used. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. I want to thank everybody who joined us and I want to thank, uh, wish everybody a very happy uh, Friday and uh, do enjoy your weekend. We'll see you all next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.